New Year, everybody. Happy yeah. New Year, Tim. Oh, well, yeah. 2018. It's crazy, right? You remember when 2000 came around and we all thought, oh, my gosh, the year 2000 next year, Stanley Kubrick, 2001, which yeah. the, the future is here. <laughs> I watch I watch 2001. I, I, I still feel like that's... A hundred years in the future. Brother, I remember in <laughs> 1984 when we were going to party like it was 1999. <laughs> so, oh, man. 2018 uh, strikes me as perfectly ridiculous. Uh, in, in another 18 years, when Hero flies over in her jet-powered yeah. pack supercar yeah. yeah uh and we're still doing this <laughs> crazy i wonder what because what do we got here we got we went D, uh dvd yeah blu-ray yeah and then this whole 4k situation we got we have 4ks like nobody's business today we got we got we got we got a uh, box box that we saved up from before the holidays so we're going to bring that out got a couple of listener mail deals and uh just quick housekeeping 2018 coming up. Be uh, be perfectly. We encourage everyone to go ahead and uh, send us emails, vox boxes, whatever you want at uh, gods at digigods.com. Eventually, going to switch that over to a gods at cinegods.com account, but for now, it's gods at digigods.com still. And uh, of course, go to the Facebook page. The uh, Digigods Facebook page is is a uh, uh, member only thing. You can apply to join the uh, community. Otherwise, there's the Cinegods page and, of course, Cinegods.com, which we are still working some bugs out of. Uh, Going to make a few posts this week before this thing really, really kicks into high gear. And uh, that's it. We got a we got a big year ahead. It's going to be an interesting oh, year of oh, movies. Man. Yeah, yeah. We got the big. Uh, the, the, we have the big show. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. In which I gave a a, a speech for uh, uh, yeah. Jordan Peele gave him yes. best best uh, screenplay. Yep. There, which was a, quite an interesting sort of experience. We'll yep. uh, we'll talk about that. Yep. And uh, all kinds of neat things. Yeah. Uh, the, the movies. Yeah. You know, the, the say the least of which. You know we're gonna we're gonna start. Uh, we've had a few, by the way, uh, a few late uh, passings in uh, 2017, and uh, Rose Marie is the one that kind of broke my heart. But she was 94. Yeah, I, and she did have that wonderful doc uh, yeah. that came out just yeah. at the end of last year. Yeah. You know, which was really mostly just her sitting there talking yeah. smack. <laughs> uh, talking talk about Capone and the, the boys, yeah. she called them the boys. Yeah. Hanging out with the boys, yeah. Rosemary, who was famous, like famous, uh, from the age of about three or four years old, yeah. with that big voice, yeah. uh, singing, uh, and obviously the Dick Van Dyke show and all that kind of stuff. But Rosemary, yeah. that was just it was an amazing thing. Yeah, very true. Well, speaking of, I'm going to I'm going to start off. We have uh, you know, a lot of stuff accumulated over the last couple of weeks. We got to clean this up today. So, uh, this is our 2017 cleanup show. Um, this will probably go live right around the time of New Year's, but it is still 2017 as of the time that we're talking about this. So, um we got a lot of classical stuff, uh, some great titles from Naxos. I'm just going to roll through these so that uh, you, all the opera and classical fans out there, I'll get you out of the way right uh, right quickly. Um, some, uh, some, you know, I, again, I'm not huge on opera, but I can appreciate it. I've been to some operas. Royal Ballet from Opus Arte, the Royal Opera House. Kenneth Macmillan's Anastasia. Uh, I've always been a big fan of the, uh, the animated film Anastasia. Ah, yes. Uh, it, which, because our friend David produced the CD-ROM interactive Anastasia, and I did the voice of a Russian shopkeeper on that CD-ROM, uh, which is just weird to me today that I did that. But, well, uh, it's weird that we probably need to explain what a CD-ROM is. <laughs> anyway, was. I did not even realize until this, the story of Anastasia, which of course is the legend of the, the youngest daughter of the Tsar, who, who allegedly yeah. had escaped, and I think that's been debunked now because they found her remains. They found remains, uh, and I suppose, the, the, yeah, it's yeah. an interesting story. Yeah. yeah, it went on for years. So anyway, of course, there's the old Ingrid Bergman movie. I didn't realize that Macmillan had done it as an opera. And uh, what's interesting, too, is that simultaneous to this, the, the team of uh, Lynn Ahrens and, uh, and Flaherty, uh, is it uh, Timmy, Timothy Flaherty? Well, anyway, Ahrens and Flaherty, who did the music for the animated Anastasia, yeah. they took all that music and they have expanded it into a live, full Broadway, off-Broadway performance thing, which I think goes to Broadway this season. Wow. And it's amazing. It's beautiful. And of course, they have, you know, they did, they originally did ragtime. So yeah. this is kind of getting them a little bit, bit closer to that ragtime thing. But anyway, uh, so the story of Anastasia, legendary one, interesting opera, um, more modern opera than anything else, but certainly interesting. 
Then there's also Bellini's Norma, which is part of the uh, Macerata Opera Festival. Uh, that's really quite opulent and beautiful and great, uh, great art direction. Really, really fantastic. Um, Albenberg's Lulu, which uh, is, you know, is it, another again a modern opera. Not really my my speed. I'm not I. Don't really understand the story, but uh, Berg is apparently a figure, and Lulu has uh, has a following. Uh, let me get a few others here. Uh, Carmen can't go wrong with Carmen. We got a new Carmen from C major uh, with the uh, Vienna Symphonic uh, Orchestra, and uh, apparently a really great cast. Um, we got a ballet here, Don Quixote with uh, Rudolf Nureyev. Oh, Nureyev. Uh, that's from also from C major, on, all on Blu-ray. Uh, the Art of David Halberg at the Bolshoi. Uh, double Blu-ray from Pathé uh, with Sleeping Beauty and Marco Spada on it. I am not a David Halberg. I, I don't really understand David Halberg, but you know what? Pretty impressive. So, you know, if ballet is your thing, that's there too. Um, let me uh, pull out some of these. We have also got... Oh, this is really interesting, by the way, actually. Um, oh, and uh, The Nutcracker. This should have gone on to a Christmas thing. We didn't get it in time, but there is a new Nutcra Nutcracker from the uh, Royal Opera House Royal Ballet line of Opus Arte. Uh, always beautiful. You can't really go wrong with The Nutcracker. Nutcracker is always fantastic. Um, this, has, this is really, really nicely staged and, uh, you know, pretty much anything at the, uh, the Royal Opera House. Um, this is what I want to make mention of. This I thought was really interesting. This is a 4K of Tosca. Mm. This is the first time that I've seen anything from uh, any of these classical releases, uh, ballet, opera, classical, anything. This is the first time I've seen anything released in 4K, oh. which is very impressive. Uh, Tosca, of course, is uh, by Puccini. This is one. Uh, this is uh, the Royal Opera House Chorus and Orchestra at Covent Garden. Covent Garden is amazing. Yeah. I love Covent Garden. Uh, forget about the Covent Garden set that you see at the beginning of uh, My Fair Lady. That was actually the Warner Brothers lot. <laughs> so that's that's not the actual Covent Garden. The actual Covent Garden is a great place to hang out in London and have lunch. Uh, and, of course, to see things like Puccini's Tosca. Absolutely terrific. Angela Giorgio, Roberta Alagna, Ruggiero Raimondi in Puccini's Tosca. This is from Art House Music. A 4K release. The first one of its kind for classical. So this is a really, really, really big deal. Um Shot on 35, I should point out, shot on 35 millimeter film, mm. and then released now uh, 4K. Very, very impressive. Um, we've also got, uh, this was part of our uh, some of the gifts that we gave away, uh, but we didn't get one to, uh, to actually review. Time Life, CMA Awards Live. So we finally got ours to review. And uh, this is amazing. If you're if you're a country music fan, you're just going to go nuts here. The 127 live performances over 50 years on this thing. It, you could just sit here and watch it for hours and hours and hours. There are nine DVDs in this box set. Uh, it's, it covers from 1968 to 2015. And it is a really fascinating kind of history of country music at the same time. Uh, I used to poo-poo country music a lot, as a lot of people did from my generation, mm. until you realize it's a really, really rich history, and it's changed a lot over the years, and it's global. Yeah. It, it, it's global. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. You know, you've got, uh, what's, his, what's his name from Australia, Mr. Nicole Kidman there. <laughs> I mean, you know, it reaches far and wide. Uh, also from the Royal Opera House and the Royal Ballet is a twofer here. Uh, a couple of uh, ballets from Christopher Wheeldon. Cinderella and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Now, did I know that there was a, 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 a Cinderella ballet? This is done by the Dutch National Ballet on here. Uh, yes, that I knew. And it's beautifully, you know, Prokofiev did the music. Absolutely beautifully, beautifully conducted uh, as well by Armano uh, Florio. But I did not know that there was a ballet of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Oh. That I did not know. So you learn something all the time. Uh, both of them very, very nicely staged. We also have um, on a uh, really kind of, this is a little bit too aggressively modern, a modernized version of Mozart's Cos Cosi Fan Tutte. Um, not quite my speed. I, I like the music. Not sure that I actually like this, uh, this, this national Parisian opera staging of it. 
By the way, did you ever see the uh, the movie Cosi years ago, twenty years ago? It was a oh Max yes, release with Tony Collette. Yeah, about the, the staging in, in insane asylum inmates staging Cosi fans. Oh yeah, oh, this is fantastic. Great I Tony movie. Collette, I could believe it. Anyway, I missed that movie. It's now caught up in the whole Miramax. Oh yeah, thing. yeah. Uh, Verdi's I, I Due Foscari. This is from C Major from the uh, Teatro alla Scala uh, with Placido Domingo. All you need to know. Placid Domingo, Verdi. Nothing else needs to be said. Beautifully staged, amazing performances, really wonderful. Even if you don't like opera, Domingo is always a reason to uh, to, to take, any, take a, a little time out. Uh, also from Verdi is the uh, Mesa de Requiem uh, with the uh, Zurich uh, uh, Opera House uh, chorus and, uh, and orchestra. Um, absolutely beautiful. Just gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching music. Uh, Shakespeare's Cymbeline is also out on a uh, Blu-ray from the Royal Shakespeare Company as part of the Opus Arte line. Uh, not musical, but because it is uh, Opus Arte, it goes in with all the uh, the classical stuff, and that's very nice. We also have, as long as we're in kind of a festive year-end religious mode, uh, Bach's St. Matthew Passion, which is one of the great all-time choral uh, works ever in history. This is really, really wonderful. It's a DVD, not a Blu-ray, so you're not getting lossless audio on this. You're just getting the regular DVD DTS. However, it is plenty adequate just because the the, the majesty of the performance is just so tremendous. Uh, got a couple of other interesting things here. Programs 13 and 14 on one disc and 15 and 16 on another of the All-Star Orchestra with music director and conductor Gerard Schwartz. Um, this is a, a, a thing that Naxos has been putting out for a while. We've never covered this before, and it's um, it's kind of a cool thing to be honest. Uh, I, I you know the the performances here are are pretty great, but what what this is is like the greatest um, per, the greatest musicians from the top thirty orchestras in America. And they're all put together, and I don't know who, whose job it is to say you're a better violinist, you Boston first chair, than yeah. the person in you know the L.A. Phil or versus you know whatever. I don't know. I don't know who gets to make that call. I guess Mr. Schwartz. But it, still, it's like the ultimate orchestra playing the ultimate music, which includes uh, Enigma Variations by Edward Elgar in Program 15, which is some of my favorite all-time music. Elgar and uh, John Sibelius's uh, Symphony Number no. Two on Program 14. Really, really interesting. Very fascinating concept. Uh, I like it. It's, it feels like it could be a little gimmicky, but it's not. Uh, it actually really, really plays. And then we've got some uh, Blu-ray CD combo sets here. Uh, one is Black Sabbath, The End, uh, from 2017 in Birmingham. And you know what? Uh, I've never been a Black Sabbath fan. Uh, but it's Ozzy, man. Yeah, it's um, Ozzy. You know, I am kind of an Ozzy fan. So uh, <laughs> there, if you're sitting around and you're an old rocker and you're you're like Ozzy and you're a little stooped over like he is every time I've seen him at the drugstore, <laughs> shuffling down the aisle where there there are you know clearly something for incontinence or who knows what. Yeah. Uh, he 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 gets young again here. He really uh, pulls it together. And uh, let's see. And then we've also lastly on the music end. Got a uh, quartet of releases here, Deconstructing the Beatles. Uh, this is an educational journey on four albums, Sgt. Pepper, Revolver, The White Album, and Rubber Soul. Yeah, yeah. Each one gets its own uh, its own DVD, and um, it's it's really quite interesting. Uh, you, you learn probably more about the, what went into these albums than... Um, <laughs> than than you will ever want to. Um, it, this is basically kind of a, it's, it's musicology is what it is. And um, it's kind of a tour on how these albums were put together and the process of recording and writing and producing. And it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, I know a little bit about it. Tim, I know, you know you're the son yeah, of a well, musician. Yeah. You know a little bit more about this stuff than I do. But it was interesting nonetheless. Fantastic stuff. All right, so that's it. We've uh, we've got the music, uh, Tim. We we have uh, we've accumulated a fair bit of LGBT stuff as well. Yeah, TLA releasing. Uh, 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 what is this? Uh, Deku, Deku, 
Oh yes, uh, Deku is the line. That's the, the line. The, the from distributor. PLA? The distributor. Yeah. And most of the stuff is uh, our t- television series. Uh, you yeah. know, sort of like little small indie television series. Interesting stuff, particularly uh, since we just spent a good good amount of time praising "Call Me by Your Name." Um, uh, the, our, not, our, our favorite film of the year. Our favorite the film, film, yeah, film, film critics. You know, a film about uh, a sort of encounter between two gay men of a certain age in Italy. A beautiful film. Interesting that neither one of those guys are gay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yet, yet, yet we have the stack of movies here with all actual gay people, yeah. more or less, doing all the same stuff they did in that movie, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, has always been a little interesting to me. But some of this stuff is interesting just because it's genre stuff. Um, uh, so uh, first, we'll, we have uh, season one of. Uh, I'm fine, which is really just one of these um, lovely little, uh, almost sitcommy sort of dramas about four guys, uh, in, in, you know, young guys in their twenties, uh, roaming around. At the center of the whole group uh, is one guy, about twenty-something, Jeff, uh, who is just everyone is just smitten by him, and everything uh, is just sort of floats around him. But he, of course, he's hung up on his ex-boyfriend. So, you know, if that's a sitcom. That's a television series right there. Uh, it's interesting. Not a lot on it. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, kind of you know, okay if that's, what, that's the kind of stuff that we're doing. Center, uh, center of my world, also from TLA. This is an interesting uh, little movie. This one is about a young man who uh, comes home for the summer to find that his twin sister and his mother have quit speaking to each other. And there's a whole lot of drama going on and something behind the scenes. He doesn't care about any of that. He's trying to have his last summer. Uh, And then uh, another boy comes in who's a friend of the sisters, and they have a little affair. It's a perfectly lovely little movie. Uh, German with English subtitles uh, is center of my world. Nice little thing there. Uh, A Place in the Sun. This kind of reminded me of... Um, uh, Polanski's Knife in the Water. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, in a particular kind of way. It's about this uh, young woman uh, who meets a, a fella in, in a club. Uh, and uh, she brings him home, and a little bit later, uh, 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 her, her, her fella's friend has a friend who comes over, and he's jealous. Uh, but he's not jealous of the girl, he's jealous of the boy. Uh, and, uh, you know, some e- emotional stuff, sort of stuff ensues, and uh, a little thriller gets set underway. Uh, also kind of reminded me a little bit of, um, well, not the talented Mr. Ripley, but the one that, that was uh, Blue Moon? Was it, oh, uh, Something like that. You know what yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of reminded me of that in a, in a particular sort of way. Uh, this one here, um, You Can't Escape Lithuania, is a really neat film. Again, that's a I, depressing title. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I guess, you, unless you really love Lithuania, but, yeah. uh, it, it, it's a neat thing. So you have this, you have this. Uh, it's, it's it's like a movie within a movie kind of thing. You have this guy who's making a movie. Um, um, you ha- he has this main actress who's in this movie. She kills her mother. He has to help her escape Lithuania. As okay. they are attempting to escape Lithuania, he decides he's going to keep making his movie. Mm-hmm. And they end up making this sort of uh, ex- little experimental film. Again, the thing that I love about all of these movies, w- while in fact they are uh, gay cinema, uh, they, they're all genre cinema. This is just, these are just true. genre movies. Uh, and, and as it happens, you know, the love scenes and the romances are between people of the same sex. But other than that, these are just genre movies. Um, a Date for Mad Mary is an interesting little comedy, for instance. It's about this, one, this girl uh, uh, who, who, who goes off to prison, comes home for a little, time in, a little town in Ireland, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, she has a best friend. Her best friend's about to get married. And Mad Mary uh, wants a plus one. Uh, but her friend tells her, look, I'm not going to give you a plus one because, you know, you're not going to be able to get a date anyway. You know you know that, right? So this is about Mad Mary and everything she does to try to get a date. And when she realizes uh, who she wants to bring to that party, it's not a fella, but a really cute gal. So that's kind of interesting. Um, Inheritance, uh, Jessica K., a Mark Webber film. This is, this is a pretty neat and, and intense movie. Uh, uh, it has a director's commentary on it too, so you're going to want to check that out. Anyway, um, this one has a young woman who's returning to her childhood home, and she's she's dealing with the death of her estranged father, 
and her crazy freaking brother, played by Mark Webber, who's a very intense young actor who I, who I like a lot, and it, what all goes on between them and another one of their friends from long ago. This was a pretty intense little movie, South by Southwest, uh, last year, 2017. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, again, when you think about some of the films that we've been talking about lately, this just fits in with any of those movies. Sure. A, a good, solid genre, genre film. The Body Electric. This is a pretty neat little film. Uh, it's about this guy who's working in this textile factory, and he has a whole bunch of buddies that he hangs out with, and they work in these long shifts, and they go out, and they have parties, and they meet all kinds of new people, and they decide that they're going to go out on a long weekend and have themselves a wacky adventure. This is just as sweet and funny and sort of little magical a film as you ever would want to see. And, you know, it's it's not particularly gay, except, you know, there's, there's, there's you know, one or two little relationships in there. But it's just about people discovering who they are and what they like and that they actually like the lives that they have right now. A uh, perfectly lovely movie. Special Features includes an interview with the director, uh, Marcello Catano, uh, and, and his short film I just saw here, Ball. I never did see that film. So that huh. might be interesting. Here's a series... Uh, that's kind of interesting. This oh, and season two of that is coming out se uh, soon as well. Season two of this one is coming out yeah. soon? Okay. Uh, this is about a fan... It, 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 I, I don't even know how to pronounce the title of this. It's like Rome, 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 Rome. Yeah. It, 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 Rome, 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 and Rome. It's yeah. something like that, yeah. right? Anyway, it's about this family. It's kind of these, these two families who years and years and years ago was something that went down between these families. Uh, and they're all sort of uh, remotely involved in crime anyway. And two people in each one of the families become romantically involved. And uh, it could lead to a whole bunch of stuff that goes on. Anyway, this is the first season of that. Part one, anyway. So I don't yeah. know if it's a... It's, yeah, it would be a season. It's part one. Yeah. Yeah, of a two-part and, series, and the uh, the uh, this yeah the second season or second part is coming out uh, in a matter of weeks, actually. Uh, a couple of more of these. Uh, Dream boat. Uh, this is actually from Strand. Yeah, Strand. Well, Strand pioneered the. Uh, Strand was actually the first company to to sort of focus on LGBT yeah. uh, titles, and that's how they sort of branded themselves. They don't do as much of it anymore, but they that was the original. Uh, that was originally their bread and butter. Mm. They were the only. They were the only distributor that would go around to uh, to LGBT to Outfest. To Outfest, yeah, because yeah, I just cover Outfest people. all the time. Yeah. Uh, Dreamboat. This is this is a neat movie. Uh, it's about these guys who once a year go out on one of these sort of big gay cruises and and, and, and do this and do that. But really, it's about the sort of uh, um, emotional holes in some of their lives and 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 what's missing because they can't always have the sort of families that they would like to have. And some yeah. people are still in the closet. And, and and the difference between younger gay men and, and older gay men and how that uh, doesn't always line up as well as you would think. It's a perfectly lovely movie uh, from Strand uh, releasing. Uh, Hidden Kisses. This is from Breaking Glass. Yes. Uh, what do you know about that company? Uh, Breaking Glass. We've covered Breaking Glass for quite a while. Breaking Glass is a, is also a uh, a primarily focused on uh, on LGBT uh, stuff like like uh, K Shop, which ah. is which is a, like a like one of their. Um, it's kind of like a gay horror film. <laughs> which yeah. Is, yeah. Doesn't sound good when you say it that way, no. but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a gay horror film. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> it's a perfectly, perfectly. Yeah, perfect. Anyway, that that's yeah. K, K shop. Is yeah. that from Strand? Who's no, that? This from? Is, that's from Breaking Glass. That's from Breaking Glass. This yeah. this one from Breaking Glass too. This is Hidden Kisses. This is a perfectly lovely movie about a sixteen year old boy. <clears throat> excuse me, who's. Um, uh, he lives along with the, with his father, and, and, and they're having some issues. A, a new kid comes to the high school, and he yeah. falls in love with the new kid, and it puts him in a situation where he has to figure out whether or not he's going to tell his father that he's gay, and and uh, as he develop, develops this relationship, it's a perfectly loving, touching movie, uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's a really neat thing. Um, and Coffee House Chronicles, uh, exactly what it is—a series. Uh, Coffee, the, the Coffee House Chronicle, the movie. Uh, and it's about a, it's about a, it's like, um, oh, what was that one? There were Wang Wang and, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, Smoke, uh, Smoke, uh, Smoke, well, there were, smoke. there were two of them. There's, it was Smoke. And, and Coffee then, and Cigarettes? And, no, no, that's, that's, that's the other thing. That's Jim Jarmusch. Smoke, Jarmusch. and then what was the follow-up that was all, mostly oh, improvised? My, blue in the Face. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. right. So this is one of those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, only with a whole bunch of really, really buff gay guys. Mostly I watch these movies and I think, man, I need to go to the gym. <laughs> A documentary by Gerald McCullough called uh, All Male, All Nude, which is uh, very, very interesting. Um, um, uh, straight men, gay men, bisexual men uh, who are all sort of uh, roaming around 
uh, these clubs, uh, and you have these men who identify themselves in very, very particular ways, and this documentary sort of gets behind the scenes of all of that. It's extremely interesting. Uh, special features in, in includes an uncensored uh, short uh, uh, behind the, the soundtrack, because music is very important in this, because that's, that's what's going on in a lot of these clubs. It's intense stuff, but it's very, very interesting. Uh, so, um, all male, all nude, and that is also from Breaking Glass. Awesome, Tim. You, you killed it. Uh, so we're going to talk about some TV now. Yeah. Uh, some really, really big TV releases came out, uh, just in the last few weeks. Uh, one of them was not Fuller House, the complete second season, but I feel obligated to sort of put this on people's radar if you were a fan of Full House. Um, it, full it blows me away that that actually stuck around for two seasons. It, it's sort of bizarre. Uh, you know, and this was also, they tout this on the box, too, that, that uh, Fuller House, mm. and for those who don't know, the old series Full House was brought back as like a, in a desperate attempt to, to sort two of... Two of the kids, the older daughters, but not the two twins, yeah. because they're bazillionaires and don't have to do crap television. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, the, the older daughters, and they've got... Anyway, uh, the, the next generation, Fuller House. Um, uh, this actually is the winner of the 2017 People's Choice Award for Favorite Premium Comedy Series. Now... I just want to. I just want to read. I want to read that again. Winner, 2017 People's Choice Award. Mm-hmm. Right there, you're mm-hmm. already on, uh, on yeah, thin ice yeah. because People's Choice Awards are ridiculous. Yeah. Favorite, not not favorite series, not favorite comedy series, but favorite premium comedy series. Yeah, you gotta you gotta find the niche that you can stick it in where there's only one other show. <laughs> what what others are there? Transparent in this? I have no. Is idea. that it? Are they the only two? <laughs> I have no idea. That's so funny. Candace Cameron and Jody Sweeten were the two. Those two kids. And I used to watch that show. That show yeah. with you know, Bob Saget. Bob yeah. Saget was funny. Yeah. And, of course, the, uh, the, the never-aging John Stamos, uh, who never appears on this show. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 Aunt, and Aunt Laurie. I forget what, her, what the actress's name uh, is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway. So, um, all right. So here's, here's, uh, here's what we're, we're a little bit excited about. We got, we got a couple of things that we're excited about. And uh, one of them, we talked about the, uh, the first uh, five seasons of South Park. Well, Paramount has now added another six. So uh, we get six through 11 uh, on Blu-ray, beautifully put together, uh, all the same, you know, great stuff. You get commentary on here with, uh, with uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, and it's always great. And I would almost recommend that you listen to it just with the commentary on because the commentary is it's not just funny, but it's also really, really educational. I am a big fan of these guys. Even if I haven't been a fan of the later seasons of the show, uh, they just—it's always interesting to hear what they say. And uh, one thing that I was thinking about too is, do you realize the? This goes back a bit, but I remember when the first season of South Park came out, mm-hmm. they they wouldn't let Trey and Matt do commentary for it. They released the commentary separately because it was too blue. Ah, okay. Which is, yeah. you know, so you had to get like the commentary on a CD and play the CD simultaneous to the thing. And it was all very clunky. And eventually they remedied that. But um, they, they were so skittish at the time. It's so weird, though, because it's not like, the, it's not like South Park, the, the shows, were ever PG. No. So I can't imagine them being any bluer than, no, you know, know, than Cartman. Crazy. I mean, you know, Cartman was blue. Crazy. But there are some amazingly great episodes in these seasons, and uh, a lot of the really, a lot of the really, really classic stuff that you remember uh, that comes from uh, from these seasons. Usually, from, it's usually somewhere around like something from about five, six, seven. Those three seasons in particular are really, really classic. So, uh, South Park has gone gone all blue, and uh, first eleven seasons now formally out on Blu-ray. Uh, we've also got, before I let Tim, uh, get into what we think is something really super cool, um, uh, Salvation, which I had, I was unaware of. This is season one of a science fiction show from, uh, CBS and Paramount. Um, it's okay. It's not bad. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, one of those apocalyptic shows that, uh, that's kind of become all the vogue now. And uh, it's it is it's it's more cerebral than what you normally get, and I appreciate that. Uh, the uh, 
you know, the earth on the brink. And I think we probably all think about that a lot more now with things like North Korea and finding out that North Korea has, apparently has just piles of anthrax that they're ready to unleash yeah. on the world. And, yeah. Well, I don't know, but this is one of those asteroid hitting towards yeah, the, and, and yeah. They made all those movies in the 90s all yeah. right. so, you know. But it's it's nice. It's well handled, and the acting's good, and there's some, you know, the science in it. It's 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 close enough to our day, and it's... It just it, it, it works. It's a it's a decent show. So I'm looking forward to you know more in the future. Not on Blu-ray, strictly on DVD. And then uh, what didn't need to happen, much like <laughs> much like Fuller House, is Gilmore Girls: A Year in the Life. I don't I don't know where you know, this you, came that from. that's the that was 2000, the year 2000 again. Yeah, uh, that that original series kicked off. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, they went ahead and they did you know a Gilmore Girls reunion thing. Two discs here, uh, broken up into seasons. Um, you know, the, the, a year in the life, whatever. Okay. I, I liked the show. It was fun, but, oh, was I, fun. I, did, but yeah. I didn't, I didn't need this Blu-ray. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it had a following that was yeah. perfectly insane. Tim, uh, on, we're very excited. On, on the, on, on the heels of the new dynasty, because you know, there's yeah. a new dynasty series yeah. that's, that's running around. Haven't watched any of that yet. You know why? Because in 1981, I started watching this dynasty. <laughs> and I don't know what they're doing on that new show, but they're not getting down like Joan Collins and, 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 you know, and the Linda cat Evans. Fight. The, oh, oh, dude. The fight that went into the pool. That's the, that's it. The, 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 oh, that's it. That, the, it that is fantastic gr- stuff. That is just great. Look, I love Dynasty, every trashy second of it. And here's the, here's the thing that I love about Dynasty. Dallas really invented this genre. Dallas yes. was the first primetime soap opera that took all that trashy daytime stuff and wrapped it up and made it look like primetime, yeah. glowing in primetime, late yeah. 70s. Yeah. And it was so successful at it, the next thing you know, you have spinoffs of Dallas. Falcon you know, Fal- Crest. The Falcon uh, Crest. Flamingo Road. All that stuff. All of and which I watched. Uh, Knott's Landing was Knott's the specific Landing was the spin-off. Specific, yeah. yeah. But nobody mm. actually went toe to toe with Dallas except Dynasty. Except Dynasty, that was the one. Yeah, that was it. Uh, and because the context was relatively speaking the same, you know, you took the, yeah. the rich and powerful guy, you put him at the top, and these two women, and the number of people. This is the entire. This is the complete series, by the way. 100, 217 episodes on fifty seven discs, all kinds of special features. So sort of three uh, big boxes, uh, seasons one through four. Five through seven and eight and nine in the third box. And when I look at the back of this box and I see Heather Locklear and I see Diana Carroll uh, and I see Catherine Oxenberg. Oh, uh, so, you know, I mean, this is the way to do it, boys and girls. And I, you know, I am I am also a fan of the Colbys, which yeah. was the spinoff from yeah. Dynasty. Yeah, yeah. Jeff Colby, who was a... Uh... And my favorite moment, I, I, I kid you not, my favorite moment in television history... It's not from Star Trek. It's not from my beloved China Beach. It's not even, you know, anything from I Love Lucy. No. (laughs) My favorite moment in television history is when Fallon on the Colbys is abducted by a flying saucer. Yeah. That is television classic right there. (laughs) How we get from... From John Forsyth and Linda Evans to the second actress to play their daughter. Yeah. Because yeah. there were two, there were two yeah, Fallons two, and yeah. two Stevens. Yeah. Uh, to being abducted by uh, aliens is, is just priceless. I, I am you know, so grateful they, for that. After they, after, they, after they killed JR and brought him back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, Bobby. It was Bobby they, they killed. They killed Bobby and yeah, brought him back. back. You know, yeah. it was who shot JR. Yeah. Uh, it was it, it was uh, mirror, yeah, the, the whole mirror, dream mirror season while he was doing it while yeah. he was doing his contract renegotiation. And after they did all of that, you know, they thought about George Prepard. It's all kinds of stuff. After they did all of that, it was it was fair game. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, it, the right. alien didn't didn't strike anybody as particularly strange. Uh, I cannot believe I, I watched all of that stuff with at the heels of my mom. Yeah, I know. Years and years and years ago, absolutely. Where are we going? Uh, we're, we uh, a few more things on TV. Uh, Luke Cage, complete first season from Netflix, is out. One Sol- of the solid show, real solid show. One of the four Defenders shows. Uh, if if you didn't see it, so here's the thing about Luke Cage. So um, so far, I guess this is how it's broken down. We've had two seasons of Daredevil, mm-hmm. one season of Jessica Jones, mm-hmm. one season of Luke Cage, and then that one season of Iron Fist. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Defenders miniseries that wraps them all together, which is really like uh, simultaneously a 
a second season of Iron Fist and a third season of Daredevil with special guest stars Jessica Jones and Luke Cage. Luke Cage. It's kind of how that is. And the and, Punisher shows up in... Which I haven't watched yet. How is it? Have you seen it? it, it, it it's, it's pretty solid. He, sh- he shows up in Daredevil anyway. Right. He's in the second season of Daredevil. Uh, John Ber- Berkenthal or whatever yeah. his name is. But it's pretty solid. It's pretty yeah. solid as well. But not as good as these, though. Darker. See, I, I, for the way that I would rank it is I would say second season of Daredevil, best of all those shows. Mm. Uh, Iron Fist is the worst. Iron Fist is just, it's terrible. Well, I he's, tried, I tried he's, so he, he's a problem. He's uh, a problem. I'm a big Jessica Jones fan, though, i got to tell you. I, and then I would say, um, uh, as much as I love the first season of Daredevil, I would say right after that second Daredevil season, Luke Cage and Jessica Jones are right in there, mm. just kind of neck and neck. And what I love about Luke Cage, what I lo- is this first season, what I love about it, is... Uh, it, it it takes unbelievable risks. It means to be a throwback to the black exploitation era. Mm-hmm. It means to kind of you know tip its hat to all that stuff. Um, but it does a thing right in the middle where it shifts gears. And if you follow the comic book and you know the characters in the comic book, mm-hmm. it references the comic book, but it does an amazingly cool thing. It just kind of like flips antagonists on you. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mahershala Ali is the, pretty much the first half of the show, kind of the antagonist. And then it flips on you, and then there's a really there's some, an interesting there, guy that comes in. Yeah, and Alfred Woodard Alfred doing some Woodard. really really good work in there too. It's really good because yeah, you know, Cage is set in Harlem. Uh, I think uh, Devil's Kitchen is uh, where uh, yeah. Daredevil. Hell's Kitchen. Hell's, Hell's Kitchen, Kitchen is yeah. where uh, the Daredevil is. Yeah, and uh, Jessica Jones too, I guess. Uh, uh, Jessica Jones is Hell's Kitchen too. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, and, uh, and you know, so it's all so we sort of roam around all of this, all, all, all of these New York. Uh, they sort of float back and yeah. forth. It's uh, what I like about all of that. Is that they are all paying attention to each other? Yeah. Uh, unlike say, like some of the Marvel shows on the CW, you know, uh, the Flash yeah. and Supergirl, and they pay attention to each other, but they cheat. Yeah, they do. These shows aren't cheating. You know. Yeah. Every I, time there's a there's a crossover in the Arrowverse from. Uh, yeah. You know, like where where well. Look, Arrow and Flash are basically the exact same show. They're kind of like Batman and the Green Lantern. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just, it just like there's the home base and the people with the computers, yes. and you know everybody kind of the little and, team, and the little team, and they're all very cheeky about it because you know you'll have uh, the person, you know, like the girl from Arrowverse, and then uh, 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 what's his name from Flash. They oh, meet yeah. each other, yeah, and they're yeah. like, oh. And, they, and then they trade, they swap secrets because we have the same job the for only different heroes. Between Arrow and Flash, is that Arrow is uh, surly. Yeah, uh, and Barry in the Flash is uh, chipper. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the only difference. He's happy and he's sad. That's really <laughs> yeah, true. That's, that's really the only thing. Anyway, neat stuff. Uh, and then uh, some British TV uh, before we get into uh, some some docs and some new movies. Um, a lot of great stuff from Acorn from Acorn TV nineteen two season four. Really, really good cop show. Uh, this is kind of, you know, uh, they, and, and we include this again in British TV because it is part of the Commonwealth. This is a Canadian show, in point of fact. But uh, 192 is, uh, is a really, really, really good show. It's very American in its sensibilities, but it's a great cast, and it's, you know, action-packed and really good writing. And, uh, you know, I like the fact that it takes place in Montreal. So, you know, I've been to Montreal. It's a beautiful city. It's a, not exactly a crime-addled city, but it's nice. It's a nice backdrop. And, and then on uh, Blu-ray, and that's just, that's a DVD. And then on Blu-ray, Gillian uh, Anderson continues to kill it in Series 3 of The Fall, along with Jamie Dornan. Um, I just think it's great that she went to the UK to do a show. Yeah. I really do. I just think that's she's, terrific. She's the one American actress who, who, who gets to play that English-British accent. You know, I mean, sometimes she'll do those movies and, and just and do, but yeah. but she will play that British accent, and she gets hired regularly yeah. to do that, uh, which is great. I can't Fantastic. think of anybody else. Yeah, no. And she plays a uh, detective superintendent here, and she anchors it, and it's really uh, it's really a tough show. Uh, the uh, what, what's interesting here is that this is uh, I don't want to call it like a, like a genre show per se. But the, the character of Spectre here is really, really interesting and that very much dominates this. And it does start to feel almost a little bit like a superhero show on some level. Um, you know, the way that there's this kind of cat and mouse thing going on. It's really, really, uh, it's, it's pretty terrific. And then if you're a fan of George Gently, uh, the complete collection is out in, uh, on Blu-ray. All eight series, eight seasons of it uh, from RLJ. And uh, it, it's a really, really sharp show. This uh, has quite a following for good reason. And uh, this includes all 25 feature-length mysteries, 
and you can sit and watch this for hours and hours and hours and be absolutely enthralled by the great writing and the great direction. Yeah. George Gently, complete collection on Blu-ray. All right, uh, let's uh, let's talk about some new movies. Uh, oh, alrighty. Let me grab. Let me grab Judy. Oh, actually, you know what? No. Let's do our Vox Box first. Okay, great. Let's let's do our Vox Box, and before the Vox Box, I want to read one piece of listener mail, which is really interesting. Al Lai up in uh, San Francisco, longtime listener to the show, um, a, wrote us a, a an interesting little tidbit related to. The Bruce Lee film, which talks about, you know, uh, Wong, Bruce Lee and Wong Jack Man that we okay. talked about on the last show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the uh, here, here it all. Here it is. He said, David Chin, because, you know, Al comes from that neck of the woods, so he knows his stuff. Said David Chin, then a Hopgar stylist who eventually transitioned to Tai Chi, Xing Yi, was the original assignee for the Lee fight. Oh. And he fell through. So Wong Jack Man got the assignment. Uh, Chin, David Chin, was a salesman at the Buick dealership located a block away from the famed Coronet Theater and sold us our eight-cylinder century in 1974. <laughs> and then Al goes on to say that his dad performed at one of the earliest Chinese martial arts demos in the U.S. at the Civic Auditorium not long after that fight. Um, and Rick Wing, who was Wong's heir to the San Francisco Jing Mo Club, uh, gleaned a tidbit for his ebook. Already having moved to LA, Lee reluctantly trekked back to the city to attend this on the sly to show support for his once fellow street delinquent Chris Chan, who demonstrated Wing Chun that evening. So, anyway, uh, really fascinating that yeah. Wong, Wong Jack Man, not the original guy, the original guy, sold one of our listeners his family Buick in 1974. <laughs> I love this podcast. That's why we do this. All right, Al, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful anecdote. Um, good stuff, and uh, I, I'm going to research more on on the fight that could have been. That's a more interesting story to me. Well, than the movie, yeah. which is all, anyway. all all made up. Yeah. All right. So uh, Billy Milby, also a longtime listener, sent in a Vox box, and uh, we no longer have Mark to do his obnoxious. Uh, it's a Vox box. We're not going to do that. <laughs> so uh, here without we recorded it. We 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 should have recorded it and use it to drop in. Maybe I'll ask him to send me it. Oh, yeah. Send it to me so you I can because I can't. You know, we you can't. Should. We can't. We can't we can't replicate that. So here is uh, our Vox Box with Billy Milby. Hi, DigiGods. This is Billy Milby. I uh, wanted to ask a Vox Box question. You guys have thrown around the term journeyman a uh, number of times, and I was wanting to get your official origin and definition of it. I've kind of gleaned my own definition, which is a go-to studio director who you can expect a certain amount of quality from, although he's not exceptional. Anyway, it just seemed like an interesting term, and I thought you guys could shed some more light on that, uh, seeing as I've heard it so many times over the years. Thanks for everything you guys do. Really interesting question. Indeed. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, that's a word that gets used a lot. Maybe I, but Tim and my Tim and I may even have different definitions. Uh, I, for me, a journeyman, when I talk about a journeyman, is typically somebody who... Um, it doesn't necessarily originate their own movies, but they're there. They're a good director for hire, and uh, they will do you know uh, any kind of genre. They're, you just you see them show up consistently, and that happened more during the studio era than it does now, really. But there, there are people you know like uh, a lot of those guys that did westerns. Yeah. Uh, Henry Hathaway yeah, would be a yeah. good example. Like he'll do a western. You need somebody to do a do a noir. He'll do it. You yeah, need somebody you, could, to do you, you, you can look at it in, in certain ways. Oddly. Uh, a guy like Nick Rogue, although he did these very, yeah. very specific films, if you look across the genre of those films, Nick Rogue knocked them out in every genre. He did, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and they were doing well. But generally speaking, you're right, of course, a journeyman is the reverse of an auteur. Yeah, there you go. Uh, um, um, so, so that's the way I would think about it. And, and generally speaking, it's not about uh, their own material. They, didn't, they, uh, they, they certainly didn't write it. Right. Um, journeyman... Um, um, Journeymen are often brought in to fix things that are problematic mm -hmm. because they understand uh, the framework of genres. Frankenheimer would be a journeyman. Too. Frankenheimer was a journeyman. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. They're yeah. moving around those genres, and they, TV is full of journeymen. Yeah. Uh, you have people, uh, I mean, even today, television streaming or whatever it is we call television, are full of journeyman directors. Directors that, that uh, the folks out there have never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have never, ever directed features, but have uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of credits to their name 
on all kinds of television programs and every kind of genre you can think of. You know why? Yeah. Because they can make that train run on time. And, That's it. and in television, regular broadcast television anyway, that train running on time is the most important thing. Yep. Uh, can't be floating around like some like Coppola out in the middle of the Philippines. <laughs> 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 trying, trying, to, trying to get your vision on. No, dude, baby, yeah. this has to air at 7.30 yeah. on Friday. And we got to lock it in. Yeah. So that's a that's a that, that's a gentleman. Yeah. And uh, among new movies, here's one that I uh, that, that's kind of a nice little thing to shine a spotlight on from Monarch. It's called One of Us, and uh, this is a little indie. Um, deals with the you know the, the culture of a a cult, a commune that is basically a cult, and uh, you know the the politics and the spooky, creepy activities therein. Uh, this is worth checking out because it has Carly Schrader in it. And Carly Schrader kind of fell off the radar a little bit. She was, uh, it was about 20 years ago when she was a teenager. I thought she was going to be a, a really, really big deal. And uh, kind of, you know, she made Gracie, the girls' soccer movie. Yeah. And she was in Mean Creek. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I am just thrilled that she's still there. And she's still a really good actress. And I really, really hope her career takes off in, in some yeah, ways. Yeah, I remember that it, that it, She was good. She was great. She is good. She is she good. Is good. Not, and, not was, is. you know, so this is a small film. But uh, she's still there. She's still in the mix. And darn it all, she deserves a better career. So there excellent, it is. excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, let's see. What do you want to? Do you want to want to pop over to some of the new Let, stuff let's here? Hit, let's hit the 4K. Uh, the four. So is that is that is that is this that is, this is right just, here? Yeah, this is this is all our, of this stuff here. Mother is 4K Ma, uh, for, on 4K. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about this 4K uh, Blu-ray so, uh, DVD situation. So, so here's here's where things are now. So just to, to kind of get everybody straightened up, and we're we're going to be doing some stuff on cinegods.com that'll get more into sort of home. 4K theater and home 4K workflow if you're if you're doing production and whatnot, but uh, the 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 HD spec of 1080p mm -hmm. that's 1,080 lines yep. horizontal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 1,080 lines horizontal is 1,920 lines vertical. Mm -hmm. So where you got you, you, when you're going when you're moving from HD to 4K, you need to switch your thinking from horizontal to vertical. So we're not talking about vertical lines, horizontal lines anymore. You know we're at 720p and 1080p. Yeah. Forget about p. Everything's everything's p now. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is no interlaced. Interlaced doesn't exist anymore except for really really old old media. Oh, yeah. So uh, a, a, an HD set has 1,920 lines vertically. Mm -hmm. And a 4K set has nearly twice as many. So the resolution vertically is doubled mm -hmm. when you get to 4K. And that's, and when, and that's what 4K means. So um, the, we've, we've moved now. The, it's still Blu-ray. And you can still put a Blu-ray in a 4K player. And it will up-convert. It'll kind of fill in the lines mm -hmm. with some, some kind of algorithm. But... 4K stuff. That's everything's been mastered pretty much in 4K now for several years, and uh, now they're taking those masters that were down converted to for Blu-ray release, mm -hmm. and they're just releasing the original 4K masters, slightly compressed because it's you know 4K television. It's actually UHD. It's like 3,900 lines. It's not quite 4,000 lines, mm -hmm. but it's close enough. So it, it, it visually, uh, if for folks who who wonder what all of this stuff means, like yeah. and, and want to break it down to to what does this actually mean that I see that's different yep. from the other thing, it's depth. Yeah. Uh, the 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 vertical the addition of the vertical line gives you a a, scene, a sense of a deeper depth. Yes. That's what it is. Now, all of that can be manipulated when you pick up the controls of your television and hit the menu and start futzing around with all the yeah. you know, you, you know, modes and all of this kind of stuff. But that's the other thing that you get is more ability to futz around with all that stuff. And, and there are other things that get really confusing, and I'll try to explain this to people over time as people explain it to me because I have engineers and techs who, who get my eyes glazing over. But uh, <laughs> HDR, which stands for High Dynamic Range, which you also probably see once in a while on your on your iPhone when you take a photo or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually more important than the 4K because that is now more colors and richer colors and deeper colors and the colors create a sense of depth as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, it's like a, a friend of mine uh, who was my DP for all my film student stuff. He exp he's a brilliant tech and he explained it to me this way. He said, um, "More pixels is not as important as better pixels." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you know, bit depth in pixels will be the next thing, but I don't know how they how they market that. You know, it's when you get to start, it's kind of sixty four 
bit pixels and things like that. You, you, you know, and I know, uh, I know we need to actually talk about these movies, but you know the thing that it all results in to me, uh, of, again, ba- back to just what it means visually. So if you, don't, if you didn't know anything, it's about, it's about presence, right? It's about, yeah. the, it's about an ultra sense of presence yeah. uh, when you're watching uh, you know, a, a 4K thing on a 4K TV that's all tweaked out to where it's supposed to be. What yep. you get is a sense of that thing uh, the, the, those images being in the room with you. Yeah, right. Very true. Now, um, here's the thing: I don't like that. <laughs> I, I like the natural softness, yeah. and, I, and I know that we're talking about you, you, the, the, the digital media. I'm glad you're saying this, okay. but, you, but you, know, you know what I'm saying. I don't have to I, say it to you. You know, you, you know, it's a very interesting thing, uh, and this happens at awards season sometimes. And and when when you look at the screeners that we look at, they. The DVD screeners that they send us for award season are sort of all over the map in terms yeah. of quality. You know, I, I sometimes no, they still have time code. So, yeah, I mean, it, no fault against IFC, but they just flip that switch and nobody watches what what results. Yeah. I mean, you'll get. I've had in the past where like IFC will send me something and and it's just the wrong aspect ratio, <laughs> and I look at it, I just think was nobody minding this door? Like, what did it was this done by a bot? What what who who did this? No, no QC. What is what's the deal? Mm. Um, but very often I find something really interesting, and um, it is this: where we will get a movie on DVD, and I'll put it in the Blu-ray player, which will upconvert for high def, mm. but it still has the natural softness. Mm. Okay, and it looks like film. Film, yeah. And then for this show, three months later, it'll come out on Blu-ray, and I pop that Blu-ray in, and it almost makes my eyes hurt. Yeah. And I think I actually prefer. Yeah, the colors yeah. were not as sharp. The imagery was not as sharp. The edges are not as hard. But it looked. But it looked like mo- a movie. It looked like a movie. It like a movie on on yeah. DVD, up converted, and on a Blu-ray, it doesn't look like a movie anymore. Yeah. I, what I'm finding myself doing is, you know, you saw a pop in a Blu-ray, the, the, the 4K, whatever it is. Yeah. I don't actually have a 4K TV, but you know, my friend Pat, pop it in, right? And I go into, and I find myself desaturating. Uh-huh. I find myself bringing down the contrast. Yep. I find myself manipulating all of that power, all of those lines of resolution uh, in, in, in both directions to drag them down yep. to where they were yep. 100 years ago. Yes. Uh, a, a, 35, a 35 millimeter film to make that movie look like a movie again. Yep. It's a, it's, so it's a, and, and I don't know, maybe I'm an artifact myself. Of, of, yep. but, I do, I, but I know the difference, and, it's, and the other thing was better. The other thing was I, yeah, it, it is it is uh, they're going to have to start paying more and more attention because sharper and clearer and more colorful is not necessarily better. Not necessarily. Uh, you know what also is not uh, is not better is Kingsman: The Golden Circle is not better than Kingsman. <laughs> yeah. That for transition segue. Uh, so I loved the original Kingsman. I really uh. did. I thought it was cool. I thought it was just awesome and violent and and creative and Colin Firth was fantastic and you know it just. It like I know it was based on a graphic novel, but it just it just Matthew Vaughn just killed it, and he made it cool, and everything that I had loved about Kick Ass, and about X Men First Class, oh, yeah. and which he directed as well. He just brought that and put it on steroids. And Kingsman was cool. The secret, you know, secret, the private secret agents, and they conscript the street kid, and he's got the stuff and all the gadgets and the gizmos, and Samuel Jackson with that list, yeah. which made no sense, but it was still <laughs> hilarious. And it was just cool. And all of that is gone in Kingsman the Golden Circle. It's just dumb. They, they, they concoct a silly way of bringing uh, Colin Firth back to life. He's like lost his memory. And, his, and it's so ridiculous the way, they, the way they play the, the, the sort of uh, notion that, uh, oh, he's. And I'm like, no, he's not. He's on the poster. He's, yeah, he's not. I he's, know. Uh, what are you, you know. Why are you jacking around with all of that? And Julianne Moore, like, shot for maybe a week on a single set that was dressed up to look like a drug plantation in Central Poppy. America. Poppy. And, it, and, it, and all it is is just it's a, it's a set with a whole lot of greenskeeping on it. And she's the villain, and she's not a very interesting no. villain. And then there's some really gory stuff that isn't funny, no. and I don't know. And then the American angle, right? All like, the stuff with like, the whiskey guys. You yeah, know. like we like Kingsman. We have wow. There's another one that happened, just happened to be set up in America because there was the one guy who went there, and mm-hmm. we didn't know that the, you had statesmen and we had Kingsman, and you've got whips that. De- I mean, stop, Wait, yeah, yeah. stop it. It's yeah. you know, Jeff Bridges is really well cast. But yeah, yeah, hardly in the movie. No, yeah, no. Yeah. And and could I? just say the one thing that was supposed to be really really cool about this 
was uh, was Channing Tatum. Yeah. Like Channing Tatum, you're like, really, he's going to be the statesman. Channing Tatum goes into, movie. goes into a coma like 10 minutes after they introduce him. And, th- and then we're supposed to have him as the spinoff guy. Yeah. There's not going to be a spinoff. No. You just screwed up Channing Tatum's best shot. Yeah, they just jacked it straight anyway, to the heck. Is it good on 4K? Yeah, it's too sharp, though. Yeah. It, <laughs> interesting. Tons of extras. I, it, 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 on 4K, Mother, Darren Aronofsky's extremely controversial film. Which I, well, I, I still refuse to see this. It, it's controversial is not even the correct word. Um, uh, most people just hate it, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and that's not controversial at all. Most people just hate it, and then there are a few who don't. Yeah. But I don't think that makes it controversial. Here's the thing about this movie. Uh, Darren Aronofsky directing uh, Jennifer Lawrence, who he notoriously was going out with at the time, anyway. Um, uh, Javier Bardem, uh, The Return of Mel, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, um, Ed, uh, Ed Harris uh, in the film. Uh, he, he, Javier Bardem is playing this poet. It's all quite surreal, and if you're paying attention, you sort of understand the surrealness of what's going on, uh, and, and such that when it, it really starts to move into some really strange places, it's not all that surprising. Uh, if you're not paying attention, it will strike you as simply bizarre, um, which it is in either case. The movie is about this, though, very simply, without giving anything away. Uh, the artist... Uh, the artist as paramount, and what the artist is doing, and the artist's work, and uh, as paramount. Uh, Darren Aronofsky is saying in this film that I am an artist. I am a, uh, a consummate artist, and whatever I do, no matter how insane and, and, and vicious it seems to those around me, uh, uh, to those who uh, I, 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 I pretend to love me, it doesn't make any difference because the art is worth it. Uh, and then he goes about this movie simply doing that. Uh, uh, this, uh, mayhem and destruction in the service of his art, which, of course, is what this movie is, too. Mayhem and destruction. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. It's I, I get why some people... I don't actually hate this movie. I, I, I sort of understand it from that narcissistic point of view. I just don't know why anybody would want to watch it. Um, uh, Darren Aronofsky, get yourself a therapist. Uh, that's what you ought to do. And, and, and their relationship broke up right after. Yeah, right after. after. I'm like, yeah. it, literally what happens in this movie happened. And he, 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 he manifests in his relationship what is manifested in this film. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence looks fantastic, though. Uh, the 4K, I, I, I cannot imagine uh, what this film looks like in 4K because it was so overwhelming in the theater where yeah. I saw it. In 4K, I just, I don't know, it would probably rip right through me. I, so. I, I elected to not watch it, so I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's uh, it, it just it, knowing what comes in the movie uh, from people who've seen it, and you included, mm. I just said, I really don't want that in my brain. Yeah, don't need that. That's exactly the point. There's yeah. no reason to insert this narcissistic a hole's crap <laughs> in your head. And I wish, I bet you Jennifer wishes she hadn't. You're going to go with the Transformers? Uh, let, I'm going to do talk about some Transformers on 4K. So here's the thing uh, first four Transformers movies are out on 4K. That would be Transformers, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, Transformers Dark of the Moon, and Transformers. Age of Extinction, all of them, Ultra HD 4K. All of them look terrific. Uh, here's what's interesting. You can see the evolution of CGI as you go through the series. Mm. You can see uh, the 4K just reveals all the flaws. You, you're, you're like, okay, there's a little less. Wow, there's a lot more detail. Mm. Wow, the software got a lot better. Some between. of that stuff looks like it wasn't even rendered. It, it's amazing. You I know, mean, it, it looks it, it looks like you know, like the the, the, the just terrible. You you think that's really imp- those are impressive special effects? Nope, nope. Those <laughs> oh no, those. It's like watching the original Toy Story, which yeah. blew us away. Now, yeah. Yeah, and you watch Pixar, other Pixar films, and you just go, holy cow, that was primeval. Yeah. Now, here's what's really fun. This is what I want to recommend people to do. And, uh, you know, look, none of these movies are any good. The Transformers movies are all the same. It's all the same crap. And all the special features are all the same. It's, it's, you know, behind the scenes, and Michael Bay says something, and, you know, this was really hard, and this is how we did this, and so forth. And, you know, you've seen one of these featurettes. You've seen them all. And, in, and, and unless you're, you're some kind of an expert that needs to, that's like into every nuance of the Decepticons. If you're, if you're studying this crap for some reason. If you're doing a, 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 a doctoral dissertation on the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the uh, uh, gender among the Decepticons, <laughs> knock yourselves out. But here's what's fun to do. Just mix them up and yeah. watch them out of order. <laughs> yeah. I swear. If you mix them up and watch them out of order, it still makes sense. <laughs> you, just, you just find yourself going... 
Oh, look, Mark Wahlberg's uh, in on the game now. Hey, Shia LaBeouf just came back. Must have been on vacation. They make no still, less sense, that's for sure. It still makes sense. First three of these are with Shia LaBeouf. Mark Wahlberg's in the fourth one. If you just slot Mark the Mark Wahlberg yep. one in there anywhere, even make it the first one, it all still makes sense. You, 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 you know the thing about those movies is that they are wealth creating machines yeah well not anymore that not last, anymore they're gone <laughs> now last one, they were last but they but they were they were an industry uh, yeah. for a while there and mostly in the international market you know that last one was really mm. pointed at china yeah. and hong kong as much as was anything in the Very united true. states and then the and then the industry sort of comes to an end and then and, and a new one sort of begins but yeah. man oh man uh those movies uh made a whole lot of people very very rich yes uh which is interesting um, Detroit on Blu-ray, actually DVD and digital. Um, you know, from from the, from from the director of Hurt Locker and, and Zero Dark Thirty. Um, look, um, uh, a lot of people really truly loved this movie. I had all kinds of issues with it. It's I about did the too. it's about the 1967, the actual 1967 uh, Detroit uprising, which happened after some police got a little rowdy with some black folks uh, that were having a party. Uh, in in an area, and, and they brought in the paddy wagons and started smacking people around, and it was you know fairly you know, not not unlike today actually, but nevertheless, <laughs> it's it's 1967, uh, and things uh, got out of hand. One, the, the national guard got called in. Uh, the the uprising went on for several days. There was a there was a motel, at, at, at which some young black folks uh, took shelter. Uh, some things happened, and the police and the National Guard infiltrated the hotel, took several of these people uh, uh, into some a certain sort of custody, ostensibly to find out whom they felt had shot at at, at them. Yeah. No one had been shot at. Um, um, uh, from the, that did not happen at all. Things got out of control. This is all a true story, and uh, people were killed, uh, police misconduct, et cetera, et cetera. But my problem with this movie... Uh, has always been that this horrible tragedy is played by Bigelow at all as a thriller. Yeah. Uh, you know, as like, 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 like Zero Dark Thirty. Like, yeah. you know, and, and I'm sorry, this is a drama. This is a dramatic yeah. tragedy. Uh, and you just can't take this tragedy and play it like a thriller. Uh, it felt exploitative. It, I agree completely. It turns into a horror film at a certain point. Yeah. And, and she starts using horror film. And perhaps not intentionally, but it just felt. I, I thought, you know what? If if the cops were, if it, it, this feels like one of those uh, 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 hills, like hills have eyes, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it, or or even something like Deliverance. Yeah. If the cops were some kind of crazy hillbillies, and uh, the 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 people in the in the motel were you know hikers who had just wandered into the wrong yeah, yeah. neck of the woods. Then that's what this is. It becomes it becomes one of those movies, kind of a torture porn snuff film. That's type what thing. that's what it felt like. It did not feel like, uh, and that undermines was, the, the yeah, whole message, the drama. Here's what here's what I here's what what what, what occurred to me. The um the the singing group in the film. Oh, uh, 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 the, uh, yeah, uh, the dramatics. The the dramatics, of, 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 which was the actual dramatics. The actual dramatics. I mean, yeah. you know, I I, I when they heard... were very 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 young and before they were famous. What I didn't know was the original lead man of the dramatics never experienced their fame. It was because of this event yeah. that he left and went and just went to a local church choir and became choir conductor. Yeah. That is a more interesting story to me. I want to know his story. Yes. I'd yes. rather see a movie framed around him. And you know what? Don't make it just about Detroit. Make it about him. Yeah. Let me see some time after where his life went, their success. And, you know, I mean, I know we're writing a different movie here. But those uprisings as a backdrop to a human narrative as opposed to yes. them be the uprising. The, you know, it really was a little surprising. This is not really – there are really well-made, well-directed scenes in this movie. Oh, yes. yeah. Because yeah, she can do great that. filmmaking. But at all, overall, I should say overall, the movie is not very well-made. It's scatological. We yeah. spend some time over here with this guy and this cop, and he does these things, and he kills a guy. And, yeah. we, and then we spend some time over here with these people. And then there's this courtroom drama later yeah. on. I mean, yeah. we were all over the place in this movie. So it's not particularly good filmmaking. Some good performances yeah. by a few people, and all, ultimately just – the wrong tone in almost isn't it, every possible Isn't it possible funny? This way. was, for a moment, people were talking about this like it would be in the Oscar mix, yeah. and then it's just and gone. Then, yeah, well, then they actually watched it. <laughs> it's like, whoa, no. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, there you go. 
another one like that is stronger. Yeah. Um, uh, who again, when it, uh, based on another one based on a true story, Jake Gyllenhaal, Tatiana Maslany, who's very good in this, Miranda Richardson, who's also very good. Yeah. In this. All of these performances very good. Jake Gyllenhaal playing a young man who lost his legs during the Boston Marathon bombing. Yeah. Um. Uh, and uh, his family and his, uh, well, she was she, she was once his fiance, but she dumped him because he was this guy who never showed up for anything. Yeah. He shows up one time for her running in that Boston Marathon and gets his legs blown off. Yeah. Deeply moving story. It really is. Wonderful performances, Miranda Richards and all of that. For some reason, it just did not catch on. Yeah, uh, but it is you know it's it's a well done movie and I, I like it quite a lot. But it's just one of those things that happens sometimes. A movie just does not catch on uh, with the greater society. I, I love Jake Gyllenhaal, but I feel like he keeps just barely missing yeah. those parts. You know, it's I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah, you know, I'll I'll, t I'll finish off the uh, the new movie stuff with uh, this over here. Let's uh, you knock off a few more of these. Yeah, let me let me let me just make quick mention of a couple of these. Uh, you know. Guys and gun things. As long as we're talking about the, uh, yeah. the real life stories, Manhunt Unabomber with Sam Worthington and Paul Bettany. Um, and you know what? The Unabomber deserves a better movie than this. To be honest, um, the, uh, you know we lived with that for quite a while. It, Forty it, years. Yeah, and and that was a. a it was. You know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it was the most terrifying serial killer story in america it's not like manson and thinking oh my gosh he's going to break in i mean if you were a if you were any kind of a scientist or an academic of a certain type and in a certain field maybe you should be a little more attentive to your mail mm. but um you know anyway that guy that lunatic in his little cabin he he held out for a long time uh this is essentially about that hunt with uh, sam worthington playing the fbi agent who you know used forensic linguistics to sort of figure it out paul bettany plays kaczynski and that's not really good casting uh, you know, it, it just, I don't no, know. Ted it, Kaczynski was not that good looking. No, not even close. No. Uh, it's, it's an okay, it's an okay film. It's not, it's not great. Uh, and then Blood Money, uh, with John Cusack and Ella Coltrane, Willa Fitzgerald, Jacob Artist, uh, is one of these movies that John Cusack keeps seeming to make mm. where he's just being a little bit too serious and a little bit too... You know, I don't know. It's it, he wouldn't even have played this when he was twenty years younger, and I don't know why he's doing it anyway. Uh, the idea here is, you know, you've got some some guys who are out hiking around in the woods and find some money, and it turns out it's John Cusack's money, and he's armed with a gun and he wants it back. And there you go. If this were Liam Neeson, I don't know, maybe maybe I'd buy it. But John Cusack just shouldn't be doing these kinds of things. Nah, movies. he's not that guy, dude. He's not. Yeah, you're the guy from Say Anything, you yeah, know, trying exactly. to get out on the sky to come outside. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Victoria and Abul. This movie did not offend me as much as it offended some other people. It's um, it's wrong <laughs> in, 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 in a number of ways, but I understand its intention, Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, not to be offensive. It, it, basically, it looks at uh, the sort of British Raj period. This is, this is Queen Victoria. It's and kind I, of a quasi-sequel in yeah. some respects to when Judi Dench played Queen Victoria Previously in uh, uh, Mr. Her Br Majesty, Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Yeah. Brown, yeah, yeah, yeah. With Billy Connolly. You know what? The, the one thing that's clear about uh, that old queen is that she liked a handsome man in the uniform from another culture. Yeah, you know, you she know, liked Scotsman and, and then Scotsman, the Indian. You know, even the husband for that matter. Yeah. Uh, the old guy. And she, and, and she was smitten by this uh, this this particular man uh, uh, who was, and she wanted to speak the language. The, the movie basically says this. Uh, we were terribly racist. Uh, yeah. So sorry. So sorry. You, you, yeah. but, the, but the queen, she actually, you know, she, she she sort of figures some of that out and pushes things the other way. It did, it offended a lot of people. I screen, know it did, but, but it didn't really actually. But Stephen did. Frears is not an no. offensive director. You need to understand where he. I mean, he comes he comes from from blue collar England. So yeah. anyway, yeah, no, no, it doesn't make any sense. Um, Vince Vaughn, the crazy, the crazy brawl in Cell Block ninety nine. Jennifer Carpenter, Udo Kier. And Don Johnson in this crazy movie about this guy, Vince Vaughn, uh, physically shaped, uh, bald headed, all beefed up, playing this guy who's, who who has all kinds of weird and intense problems going on. There's a scene in this movie where he beats a Camaro to death. 
you know, and, yeah. and, and, the, and, and that's not the craziest, most violent scene in the movie. I don't really know that this movie, uh, you know, you know, I don't really know what the hell is going on in this movie. I mean, it's, it's just it's, one of these sort of things that's pointed in a direction. It's got some weird love during our voting meeting. Yeah, there are, a few, there are a few people who just really were into this movie. It's, I, I, what I like about it is it points itself um, and, and then it just keeps going. And, and the, whatever is the next crazy thing that can happen, it does. And it it intentionally means to evoke a kind of 70s grindhouse vibe, yeah. like those old prison movies. It even does the artwork and the title uh, in but a very similar But it's not campy way. like uh, you know, no, that, no, no, that, no. that Quentin um, no. uh, and, and Rodriguez thing. You know? No, it's not. Not That's, at all. Yeah, so yeah, anyway. So, so, and so Black 99. You want to talk about violent? Let me tell you violent. Uh, Steven Yun and Samara Weaving in the Joe Lynch film, and this is on 4K – Mayhem. Yeah. Now, Mayhem is a movie I really didn't want to like, uh, didn't <laughs> expect to like, wound up liking quite a lot. Stephen Yun, who, of course, uh, was on The Walking Dead, uh, <laughs> plays a guy, plays a just a, basically a white collar worker. And this, let, let me let me let me make clear: this is a zombie movie. It's not that there are no zombies in it, but it's still a zombie movie. Uh, the, the here's the idea. So bunch of white collar people working in this building uh he is an attorney he is a really ambitious attorney and uh as is always the case with law firms the really important people are on the higher levels so that when murder becomes an obligation <laughs> you get into a game of death kind of you know like uh like all these movies mm. game of death was that the last uh, judge dread was like yeah, that yeah. the uh what what's the the uh, the uh, the the um the indonesian movie that everybody oh, loves. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the raid. The raid. raid. The raid. There are two of those. Yeah, the they go into the building. Like that. Yeah. There's a yeah. There there you know there are a ton of Thai films that are like that. Um, so the idea is that uh, there's a virus. Isn't there always a virus <laughs> that takes away all your inhibitions? And uh, the what about you know the building goes on the lockdown and then this this vi- you know it's uh, the, while the people outside keep the building on lockdown. Everybody inside just uh, completely loses their minds, and uh, he decides that you know I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna murder everyone that stands between me and I just been fired, so mm. I'm just gonna kill them all. Anyway, uh, yeah, Samara Weaving is the romantic lead, I guess if you can say that there is one, but uh, it is uh, it is brutally and hilariously violent on a level that you can't even comprehend. Uh, it really is. It's an incredibly funny film, and it's not. I don't know that it means to be as funny as it is, but I I enjoyed just how relentless it was. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in uh, Killing Gunther. Oh my god! A- a- Ada Sashin's one target. That's the tagline for this movie. You know what's funny? Top of the way this movie it says uh, Taron Killiam. Kobe Smolders and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Taryn Ter- Ter- Killiam and Kobe Smolders are above. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Taryn Killiam also <laughs> wrote and directed this thing. Basically, it is a neat plot, though. Uh, the world's greatest hitman is this guy named Gunther. Uh, a whole bunch of other top-notch hit people decide they're sick of Gunther because he's getting all the good jobs, and he gets all the, uh, the, the swag, and he gets all the shine. So they decide to kill Gunther. But Gunther is always just one step of hit ahead. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's an Arnold Schwarzenegger film from the '80s, but right. he but he made it last week. Sweet, uh, yeah. So you know that's that. And then England is mine, uh, which tanked so badly at the box office that they've had to do two things. <laughs> they they've given it a subheading: England is mine on becoming Morrissey. For people, it's like it's about Morrissey <laughs> because England is mine doesn't tell you anything. Uh, and then what they've also done is. They put a little sticker now on the on the packaging that says, "Featuring Dunkirk star Jack Loudon as Morrissey." <laughs> so we now have we we now realize oh. that this movie is so desperate to to get they have to mention Morrissey twice yeah. and, and reference Dunkirk once. Uh, please come see our Morrissey movie yeah. in which Morrissey sings twice. The only thing uh, remotely about Morrissey, like Morrissey in that movie, is that kid's hair. Uh, it, it's it's look. It's really well done for a movie in which the Smiths don't even form yeah. until the last frame of the movie. Yeah. Uh, Morrissey sings twice, and neither of them are. And of course, he's yeah. He's not singing any famous songs. No, you know, no, yeah. there's nothing. It's yeah. like it's literally on becoming Morrissey. 
and the movie you want to see is the one that that's, yeah. that starts at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it's on Blu-ray. It's nicely done. It's well acted. It's just not very interesting. Yeah. Well. And and that brings us to Dunkirk. Ah, yes. Now, we got a lot of Nolan going on this week. Uh, mm. There is a 4K of Dunkirk along with a 4K of Interstellar to make sure that you know we're 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 milking the the Nolan thing as much as possible. And then there is also this beauty, which is the Christopher Nolan collection. Now, uh, this is the Ultra Ultra HD Blu-ray Christopher Nolan collection. Yeah. How far does it go back? What do we got? It, it, it includes. Uh, here we go. I'm going to roll right through through all of them. Yeah. Dunkirk, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The yeah. Dark Knight Rises, yeah. Inception, Interstellar. And the prestige. No, really? Yep, that's it. No, no, no. Uh, 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 following? No, we're not. No, not no. early. No, early, no. early. No, no, no. Just uh, pretty much from Batman Begins to the present. Oh, okay. That's where. That's what it is. I know. I know. So uh, that is the deal here. Uh, I, I, you get this. Obviously, you know, you get the, you, you get the four K. You get Blu rays in this. Um, it is a nice, big, thick. Mambo set, but I don't know that every movie in this really warrants it. I, I would almost recommend because I'm not again. I, I have problems with movies like Interstellar and The Prestige. I don't like The Prestige. These are the big, big. I mean, you know, to me, the, the Memento. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, the, I mean, if you, if you, that's if, the more interesting. If, film. if you put a gun to my head and say you, you choose a one, you got one. Yeah, choose a moment. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Uh, frankly, I'd actually choose following. Most people haven't seen that movie. Which is beautiful black. It's beautiful black, black, film, black yeah. and white. Yeah. Brother was brother. They, but I would choose that or, or or Memento before I chose any of these. I know. But what are you going to do? Anyway, the, uh, the 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 two new ones that are really worth mentioning is obviously Interstellar and uh, and Dunkirk. Interstellar comes with a whole bunch of you know special features that were all previously there. How does it look in 4K? It looks gorgeous. It's just too sharp. Yeah. Dunkirk, I'm more is more interesting, and and in Dunkirk, uh, because Dunkirk was mostly shot IMAX, mm -hmm. 70 millimeter IMAX, um, and, but there are portions portions of it, mostly the stuff with the with the Mark, uh, what's his name, and the, and his son on the boat. On the boat. Yeah. It was all shot 35, or uh, yeah, it was shot 35. So it's not, which is a Nolan thing. It's anyway, it's to sort of give you be more grounded. These are the people, and then we get to the war, and it blows up big. And there's a, I, I get it. But um, I wish it had all been seventy. It would have been would have been better. I I am not as elated with Dunkirk as many people are. I still mm. think it probably has an inside track to be best picture. But I don't know. It just if I had to choose between Dunkirk oriented movies, uh, their finest would be at the top of my I list. I just said that on the radio. Darkest Hour would be the next one because it's still Dunkirk. Kirk related, yeah, yep. uh, and and Dunkirk would be my third I agree. choice. Of I agree. Dunkirk movies. You know. I agree completely. I mean, I admire the craft of it, but I still think that all these stories are less interesting than perhaps what really happened. Yeah, and yeah. I got to tell you another thing too. Hmm. All those dark-haired white boys in those boats, <laughs> they I could the do. They look exactly this. I'm like, wait a minute. Which which which? Oh, Harry Styles was in this movie. Harry wow. Styles. Is, is, which one of which the guys? One? <laughs> which one of the guys that looked like Harry Styles was Harry Styles? Uh, yeah, and you know, and not for yeah. nothing, everybody in in most of this, all these handsome young men had uh, everybody had yeah. like three hundred dollar haircuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at these. I'm like, you kids look fantastic. Yeah. Uh, to be under siege, uh, such as you are. Anyway, uh, look, the only two that I knew that I could actually recognize the was uh, Kenneth Branagh and yeah. Tom Hardy. Yeah. Because you know. right, I know who they are. Yeah, yeah, and good performances by Kenneth yeah. and, and you know, and, and Tom is just sort of like flying around in that plane, you know. But nobody, yeah. nobody's bad in this movie, and it's not a bad movie. It just Mark it's Ryland. Just, uh, Mark uh, Ryland. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just it's it, there was no point in this movie where I felt the exhilaration that I felt I should I should be feeling when I'm watching a movie about the most legendary military rescue in history, yeah. where common people. Stepped up and did what the military couldn't. That's an amazing thing. And, and since really he and, and since he saw the jacks with uh, time and space in this movie, yeah, and sort of an yeah. insane way. Yeah. If you're gonna do that already, though, if you're gonna interstellar this movie, c then compress it such that this has uh, more of a sense of urgency. Urgency. Sorry. Between yeah. you know each moment, if you, because you're already messing with stuff. So you, you then go ahead and mess with it and compress it up and make it have a sense of urgency that ought to be there. Um, in Darkest Hour, you got Gary giving all those fabulous Churchill yeah. speeches. So you got a little, you got that oomph so going good. there. 
And in their finest, A, it's funny, it's while, at, while at the same time being every bit as dramatic and poignant and moving as both of these yeah. nothing but dramatic movies. Yeah. Um, so you get both. Yeah. So it I wins. Know. They're fine. Anyway, that's Dunkirk outside on 4K, and uh, we are done for the week. Yeah. We will uh, we will see everybody next week. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.